Hello. Um, I would like to thank the organizers and the intellectual minds um, who contributed to this event and also the series. Um, and of course, thank you for inviting me. It has been an excellent organization so far, and I'm very honored to be here. Uh, so uh, this talk is entitled Two Cents for the Global Future of History. The announcement for this panel said, quote, this panel will challenge the participants to outline and imagine a truly global past. So let's take the challenge and make an attempt. How, in my opinion, are we to imagine the global future of history? Assuming that the majority of world architects and architecture schools actually do agree that global history will construct a better future, what are indeed the conditions for this future? How is the future of global history possible? How is the future of globalization possible in the first place? But let me pause before uh, moving with our assumption. Is one safe to assume that the majority of architects and architecture schools do indeed desire this future? Before the participants of this panel outline a truly global past, are we safe to assume that we live in a present with truly global intentions? As the history surveys in architecture schools remain as West-centric as ever, and as the geographical scope from which architects are invited to publish and speak remain as narrow as ever, can we really assume that a truly global future is being built in schools and institutions of architecture? And the announcement already raised an alert. I take the word truly quite seriously here, and I assume this seemingly redundant adverb is not included because we, the participants, are called to work with the premise of an essential truth about global history, but because we are warned that the current state of architecture and architectural history may be misleadingly or insincerely global, and I do agree. The fact that transnational practices have indeed multiplied in the last two decades, and that architects are increasingly building in places outside of their country of citizenship, and that there are indeed more design studios and seminars in Western architecture schools about non-Western places, and that a plentiful amount of histories of cross-cultural encounters have been published in the recent years. All of these facts do not invalidate my hesitation because neither transnational practice nor curiosity about foreign countries, and certainly not the curiosity about non-Western countries, are new. They are also not values in themselves unless their difference from ages-old orientalist and imperialist imagination can be specified. In other words, that sort of architectural practice and curiosity would hardly qualify as truly global, at least not in any transformed sense that is worth imagining. So whoever the audience of this talk might be, take my two cents that may help imagine a truly global past if you will indeed help architecture schools and institutions imagine a truly global future. But let this not be perceived as an isolated criticism of a discipline. World institutions are not any different. As common as the words globalization, multinational, and cross-cultural might be, the future remains unclear since the forces of history are acting in contrary directions. Those of us who spend countless hours in trying to cross national borders would know that future historians will indeed be able to write the history of our present by simply looking at the visa <coughs> requirements that the G8 nations impose on others. And this history will not look truly global. For instance, a comparison between the visa requirement maps for different countries will illustrate my point. This is a map showing the visa requirements for Iraqi citizens, and gray indicates countries that require a visa. Conversely, this is a map for American citizens where shades of green indicate visa-free countries or special accommodating arrangements. This map is for Lebanese citizens. Conversely, this is for European Union citizens where uh, shades of uh, blue are visa-free. This is for Mexican citizens, for Vietnamese citizens, and this is for British citizens. So these maps expose the alarming discrimination in the global circulation of world citizens around the planet. Being granted a visa is not a right, but a privilege, so it should justifiably follow, then, that citizens of this world do not share the same international rights. And the difference can hardly be justified as a purely economic precaution, since visa requirements for recently booming non-Western economies such as Turkey, China, and India are equally strict. Um, but let's not give up on imagining the future of global architectural history. We still live in a world whose institutions in power seem to perceive a benefit in perpetual conflict, today between the West and Islam, 
a world where continuing geopolitical hierarchies foreclose the promises of global futures. Yet it is exactly for this reason that I think a progressive architectural scholarship and education needs to emphasize more exchange between geographic locations and more sophisticated knowledge about the entire world, while simultaneously challenging the hidden Orientalist, West-centric, or isolated studies that also claim to undertake this intention. So in my own work, uh, I have offered the concept of translation for a scholarship that I think would be better equipped for a global future. As uh, the speakers in the last panel said, um, while a conservative history perhaps would continue the established narratives uh, by adding work that just fits the framework of older narratives, um, something like global history will have to radically rewrite uh, this history. And globalization has motivated some contemporary historians to give cross-cultural encounters their due acknowledgement. Works that analyze case studies about cultural encounters and hybridizations have challenged the clash of civilizations thesis, a thesis still alarmingly operative in mainstream geopolitics and one that assumes an unbridgeable gap between the West and its others, as if a self-contained pure history of Western civilization could be written. So it's time uh, that the conventional architectural history stops being taught at schools as a linear Western narrative with a few non-Western buildings added as isolated epilogues. It's time that we historians admit the intertwined histories of world architecture. Yet a much more nuanced terminology needs to be constructed in order to discuss these intertwined histories. So I offer the trope of translation for globalization studies not only to reject this clash of civilizations thesis, but also to offer an alternative terminology to the indistinct concepts such as hybrid and transculturation and to the passive and implicitly colonial metaphors such as import, influence, and transfer <coughs> that deny agency uh, to different locations. So just to give one example of a continuing reciprocal and long translation process, let me show you this map uh, that I prepared for my book that traces the architects who migrated or traveled back and forth during the early 20th century between German and Turkish-speaking countries, at times via further east and west of these locations. So after founding the Turkish Republic in 1923, the new state invited numerous architects and planners from the German-speaking ally countries to assist in the construction of modern cities, buildings, and architectural schools, a process very similar to the one in today's China, Dubai, and Arab Emirates. What moved from one place to the other during this process were not only these people, but also ideas, technologies, information, and images in exhibitions and publications. The visions of the invited and immigrant architects were meant to infiltrate the lives of the nation from the largest to the smallest scale. The pre-war garden city model, for one, which itself developed in Germany as a result of various translations, was applied not only in the capital, but in master plans all over the country, in collective housing neighborhoods for the new statesmen, and in residential villages to locate the immigrants arriving after the exchange of populations with other countries. Metropolitan collective <coughs> housing theories shape new workers' towns. Individual houses for the new leader and other official elite disseminated the desire <coughs> for flat roofs rather than pitched ones, plain stucco facades rather than constructive ornament patterns, transparent surfaces rather than wooden shutters, winter gardens rather than courtyards, modern furniture items rather than built-in divans. Meanwhile, a group of authors and architects in Istanbul initiated an alternative path to modern architecture through both an, agenda, through both an open agenda to foreign influences and a productively melancholic appreciation of the existing wooden houses in the city. However, even in the most obvious examples of official westernization program, the results were never a direct copy of what happened in German modernism, but significantly modified versions. They were translated, but a term that requires more nuance, since these translations differed from excessive domestication to abrupt intervention, from appropriating to foreignizing translations, and since they were um, set into motion by multiple agents, including invited foreign professionals, their clients and Turkish architects, who all had different opinions about the translatability and untranslatability of architecture, and consequently, who all had a different ethical and political positions about the inclusive def definition of universality. So translations in the opposite direction from Turkey to Germany also existed, 
but exposing precisely the asymmetry and inequality in modern cross-cultural encounters is part of my intention. While in Turkey, many German architects and planners outlined the future of post-war Germany and came to influential posts afterwards. After the 1960s, generations of Turkish immigrants moved to Germany and left their traces in the migrant neighborhoods as well as the icons of modern and postmodern architecture. So to summarize, such cross-cultural exchanges in the 20th century mobilized by these immigrants, exiles, travelers, international students, officials, and collaborating local architects significantly transformed the urban and residential culture in Turkey and reciprocally influenced the subsequent professional practice of the German-speaking architects after they left Turkey. All this called for the development of a nuanced terminology rather than simply covering over the complexities with old art historical terms, indistinct or homogenizing words. So by and multilateral international transportation of people, ideas, technology, information and images generates processes of change that I'm defining as translation. Translation takes place under any condition where there's a cultural flow from one place to another. It is the process of transformation during the act of transportation. So even though translation uh, is not a process limited to language alone, I, like many other theorists, challenge the popular preconception of lingual translation as a second-hand and inferior copy where the origin gets lost. For many Anglophones who share the lucky place among the global linguistic elite, the critical and political power of translation may not be self-evident. But actually, it is through translations that a place opens itself to what was hitherto foreign, modifies and enriches its political institutions and cultural forms, while simultaneously negotiating its local norms with those of the other. This inverted value nested in the foreign as a rejuvenating force rather than a threat sharply differentiates this theory of translation from nationalist positions as well as the mainstream geopolitical positions today. Additionally, translation reveals the voice of both sides of a cross-cultural exchange, which differentiates it from colonial narratives with exclusively Western agency. Same kind of history you were referring via Marx. So nonetheless, uh, I simultaneously suggest to demystify the idea of translation as a neutral bridge between cultures, since no translation has been devoid of the geographical distribution of power. Cross-cultural conversations, especially during the modern era, have hardly been untouched by the politically charged Western hierarchies that have shaped the world and its architectures. They have thus been neither smooth nor egalitarian. Translations establish a context zone that not only makes cultural exchanges possible, but also reveals the tensions and conflicts created by the perceived inequalities between places. <coughs> so a truly global history thus needs to analyze both the liberating and colonizing forces of translation. I have to admit uh, I'm less in, in, interested in a global history that simply shows how architectural forms have en enjoyed hybridization for long centuries, but more interested in the critical potential of this history writing. Such a history hopes to avoid three common narratives. It neither perpetuates the colonial terms of cultural criticism, such as civilized and backwards, progressive international style and regressive regionalism, nor continues the myth of problem-free modernization and westernization of the world, which is predicated on the premise of smooth translatability. Nor does it support the convictions of untranslatability that glorify traditional origins and closed borders. Namely, a global history, if there is to be one, will explore not just the potentials, but also the missed opportunities of intertwined histories in order to explore the tension that block what I would call an alternative cosmopolitan ethics. In that sense, I strongly think the hybrid or its synonyms and the cosmopolitan needs to be differentiated. Thanks to the ubiquity of translations, there are architectural hybrids everywhere. An engineer might have lost sleep countless times before having the confidence to put iron in concrete based on the previous experiments of his foreign colleagues. And then an architectural student might have slept in rundown hostels for countless nights to observe what his peers had done with this technology. And then, again, a contractor might have spread the word around the world to find the proper insulation material so that a flat roof terrace could be built even in a rainy and gloomy climate, making the rare sunny day remarkably more joyful. 
As long as we define hybrid as an artifact whose sources can be traced back to different places, there's hardly anything more common than an architectural hybrid. But this alone is not sufficient to imagine a truly global future, because the same is hardly the case for cosmopolitan architecture. There might have been individual architects dedicated to cosmopolitan ideals in the past, but cosmopolitan ethics does not happen naturally by living in a multicultural society, by performing as part of a transnational group, or by being in the presence of hybrid buildings. As long as we define cosmopolitan ethics as that which is committed to a solidarity with the whole humanity, and a new ethics of translatability in an increasingly interconnected world, there will be little doubt that the productive debate for cosmopolitan ethics is still in the works. So to conclude, Walter Benjamin and Yusuf Kazim Kuni had once specified a good text as one that is translatable because, I think, its translatability would remind us that the future ground for dialogue is actually possible, constructed through many translations, but translations that do not simply assimilate or cover over the foreign, but translations that open themselves to the foreign to such an extent as to agree to be transformed. One translation at a time, if each place could be expanded towards another, a cosmopolitan ethics that is continually in the making might be comprehensible. If it can be pursued without imperialist intentions, translation is the process through which each place is open to and enriched by its outside. And if it can occur in multiple directions rather than only from Europe and United States to the rest of the world, translation is a prerequisite of a cosmopolitan ethics. Things do not get lost in translation, but they get multiplied through displacement and replacement. As such, translations have already made history. Yet for a, global, for a truly global history, for a tr truly global future, take my two cents if you will indeed help advocate more egalitarian and reciprocal translations in multiple directions and an alternative cosmopolitan ethics that guide these translations. Thank you.